Good. All right. So um, I'm your SI leader. Um, I'll be leading Calc 1 today. So real quick, um, if anybody leaving for Orgo, it is next door. This is Calc 1, um, Calc and Studies Unit. So I um, left my pen out. So if you don't have the review or the problem that I'm going to go to, that I'm going to go over, you see our studyunion.wordpress.com. Um, if you go there and go to statistics and mathematics, you should see um, the first um, line. It will say Kyla um, for Calc 1. So those are where I'm getting my problems from. And I'm also going to write them and explain them thoroughly as I go through. Um, and towards the end of this session, I will give you guys student evi I mean peer evaluation. Um, so if there's going to be you guys evaluating the study union session, please feel free to be honest. Um, it is so far to get our honest feedback from you all to improve study union. Um, and then also, I always notice this, dis this, this disclaimer for review. I am not perfect. Um, I make mistakes. Um, so if you do catch me on those mistakes, please raise your hand, say something. Um, and also, this is a study union review for you. So if you have questions, um, don't feel shy to ask. Ten, nine times out of ten, somebody else has the same question. Um, so just be sure to ask. Oh, and then one last thing. They're going to be, I think they're about, we're going over a pretty good amount of problems, around 29, I believe. They're going to be four. I'm not going to go over um, simply because I want to get more clarification before for you guys before I post them. So keep on the lookout either today or tomorrow. I will post those solutions to the four I do not go over um, with a thorough explanation um, either tomorrow or Tuesday. So if you ask why I skipped over that, that is the reason. Um, I'm posting more um, clarified solutions for you guys tomorrow. So I don't want to steer you wrong. This is your final we're talking about. Um, okay, cool. So I'm skipping number one, um, just like I said, so I can get more clarification. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and go over number two. Where is my review at? Give me a second. All right, cool. So number two, it says find the values of A and B that make this piecewise um, continuous everywhere. Can you guys see okay? Um, if it gets to a point where you can't see, please let me know um, because I'm not looking up there frequently. So if you can't see, just ask me to move it up. That's 10. All right, cool. So it's saying find A and B where it's continuous everywhere uh, for this piecewise. So what we see here, only, well, in this piecewise, X is defined, I mean, X, B is defined at 2 if X equals 2. Um, here, A, AX squared plus 10 um, is defined if X is less than 2. So that, when we put that into equation form, it's like as you're taking the limit, of this equation as x approaches from the left. Um, for this one, we're taking the limit of 3ax three, uh, three as x approaches from the right. Does everybody see that? Why? Because it's not act exactly hidden at 2, but x has to be greater than 2 as it's approaching. Cool. So let's go ahead and write those equations out. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of ax squared plus 10. Um, and those are approaching each other, so I'm going to set those limits equal as x approaches from the right. And then I'm just going to take the limit and plug it in. So a, sorry, that's a 2. Okay, so now I have 4a plus 10 equals 6a. Then I solve, and then I end up getting 2a equals 10, and I get a equals 5. So when a equals 5, those functions are defined. Clear? All right. So now I need to know what b equals um, when these functions are defined. So I need to know what b equals if, it, if I want it to be continuous everywhere. Sorry, I should have wrote that there. If I want it to be continuous everywhere, then in these empty spots, x has equal 2. But this already tells us that my b 
what my b is when my x is equal to 2. So what I can do in that case is say when a equals 5 and x equals 2, I can take my 5, which I found here, plus 10. That gives me, what's that for? 20 plus 10, that gives me 30. And then I'm going to do the same thing for my second one. It's 2, 15 times 2, and that gives me 30. So those meet at the same at the same y value. So now I know that my a equals 5 and my b equals 30. So that can be continuous everywhere. Questions? No? OK, let's move on. Um, number three. Three states. It says dif differentiate the function f of x equals 2.1 to the x plus x to 2.1. All right, so it's just asking us to find x prime. To find the derivative of this is a little bit different than the derivative of this. Um, there's a certain rule to that, um, and that rule is, I'm just going to write it here, a to the x gives you ln of a times a to the x. Always, every single time. So with this rule, I'm sorry, the derivative. How am I going to write this? Well, just, that's the derivative, that part. It's not actually equal, but you all should know that. So x in, then that gives me n. That's the formula for the derivative of x to the n, every single time. So because it's, you're adding it, you don't really have to do chain rule in this um, case. You're just going, um, you're going to do the derivative of this one plus the derivative of this one. So f prime of x is going to give me mm, ln of 2.1 times 2.1 to the x plus 2.1x to the 1.1. Questions? Oh, pretty clear, straightforward. Awesome. Let's go on to number four. Uh, this gives me a table. What's going on? Can you guys see my phone okay? Oh, no, that's bad. So we're not even going to do that. So it gives me this table. And for these, for these values... Um, for the people that walked in um, a few minutes later, um, I don't have the printout of the review, but you can find the review at ucsstudyunion.wordpress.com, um, and those are the problems I'm going through. If you have any other questions, raise your hand or be... Feel free to ask your neighbor. So this table gives me these values off rip. And it says if h of x equals g of f of x, find h prime of 1. Um, obviously, we don't have a row for h prime of 1. Um, nor do we have a row for just h, but we are given this formula. Um, in this case, because you don't actually have a function for h of x, um, nor do you have a function for f of x, g of x, um, or f prime or g prime, you have to actually go through and take the derivative of this so you can get h prime. Does that make sense? Okay. So the derivative of this, you're going to go, you're going to use chain rule. So you're going to take g prime, and you keep the inside, and then you multiply it by the derivative of the inside. So that is a common mistake. Um, most people tend to change the inside 
um, just please don't be sure to do that. You always keep the inside the same and then multiply it. Um, then multiply the entire function that you have by the inside. So once we get that, now we can go in and plug, our, plug in our values. So this says d prime of f of x. So I'm going to rewrite it like this. g prime f of x. Oh, that's, that's 1. I'm sorry. My x is 1, given from this. So now I have to find, well, when x equals 1, my f of x equals 3. So now it's g prime of 3 times f prime of 1, because my x is 1. f prime of 1 is 1. Now I have to go and say, OK, well, what's my g prime of 3? This is kind of here to confuse you, I'm assuming, um, because you don't even use these values whatsoever. So, yes? I use 3 because when I plugged in this 1, I need to, it's, it's asking me for that value when f of f of 1. Does that make sense? So let me rewrite it a little bit. So it's asking me for this. So everywhere you see an x, just go ahead and plug it in for a 1 after you take the derivative. Mm. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. See, I make mistakes. Um, so yes, f of 1 is 1. Thank you for that. So g prime of 1 times f of prime of 1. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. So it's 3 right here. Thank you. All right, cool. Any other questions? All right, so like I was saying before, this is kind of here to confuse you. I almost made that mistake of using these numbers, so please do not do that. Um, be sure to read the problem carefully. So my g of x when x equals 1 is 4. So now I have 4 times 3. That gives me 12. So the key to this one is you just have to make sure to evaluate it before you go to plug in any numbers. Questions? All right. Number five. This is asking me to take the limit, evaluate as x approaches zero of sine of 2x over sine of 7x. So when we just, usually when we take a limit, first thing I tell um, most of all the students that attend the SI sessions, was to, no matter, even if you know it's not going to work out, plug it in first to see what you're working with. So I plug in that, sine of um, 2 times 0, that gives me 0 on the inside, so sine of 0 is 0. Same thing with the bottom, 0. What rule can we use when we have 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, or anything? Yes. Lovely toss. Awesome. Thank you. So with this one, what's the derivative of sine of 2x? Somebody. Okay, I kind of heard it. Somebody yell it for me one more time. Awesome, two cosine of 2x. So you take the derivative of the original, kind of like what we did up here, then you multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which is 2. Um, same thing on the bottom. Now you have 7 cosine of 7x. Um, when we go to plug in 0, cosine of 0 is, what's cosine of 0? 1. 2 times 1 over 7 times 1, 2 over 7. Questions? Cool. So number 7, I'm going to skip that one too. Um, but what I will say, um, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, you said, can I also use what? You, you're talking about like one of the, like one of the given formulas that they gave y'all? Mm-hmm. In this situation, there's not really a way you could manipulate it because your, your x is a statement of your sign, so there's not really a way you could pull, not you could pull that x out to manipulate to say sine of x over x multiplied by another function. 
Does that make sense? Because no matter how many times you derive and no matter how you manipulate it, that entire function, you still have a sign on the bottom. So then, oh, you mean multiply the top and bottom by 2x? So just multiply by 2x over 2x, is that what you're saying? Um, you would still, because now you have an x on the top. Does that make sense? So you're asking something, I'm going to write in, this pencil's not going to work. So you're, can y'all see this? Like if I write right here? Okay. So are you saying something like this? Like that? Um, oh. So you'd have to because, remember, you still have these other ones. So you kind of have to manipulate it to look like sine of 2x over x, but you, then you still have, mm, let's see. That's, I don't know if you could do that. Um, that's a question I'm going to have to, or I'm going to have to have you ask your TAs because classes are over tomorrow. Um, but I can see trouble coming out of that. So double check if you want to do it that way, okay? But that is a good question. Any other questions? So seven um, is one of those problems I said I was going to gain more clarity on. But as I was saying, um, one thing I will leave with you guys is to really, really um, make sure you understand the definition of a critical point. So a critical point, critical points are points where the function is defined and its derivative is zero. So you take the derivative of your function, set it equal to zero, and whatever you get for your x's, those are your critical points, or where it's undefined. Um, yeah, go ahead. Number six. Did we just, oh, we didn't do that. I'm sorry. I read my five and six. That's why. So, yes, let's go over number six. Um, but since I already left a little spill on seven, we won't go over it. All right, so number six says, use the inner, can you guys hear me okay? Use the intermediate value theorem to show in which interval there is a root of the equation um, x to the fourth equals three minus x. So, basically, our intermediate value theorem, um, it tells us, if there's a root in the interval. The way we do that is basically by plugging in, okay, so this is what we have. Let me not jump the gun. This is what we have, three minus x. Usually what I like to do with these equations is move everything to one side. So now we end up getting minus three plus x equals zero. So you wanna make sure that for wherever you have, um, oh, it gives us intervals, so we're testing these intervals. So on these intervals, you want to make sure that f of a times f of b is less than zero. So basically, one, is, one of these is going to be negative, one of these is going to be positive, so you end up getting a negative number. Con clear? Make sense? All right, cool. So let's go ahead and test. So... I'm just testing each one of these numbers. So my intervals are 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, or 3 to 4. And we're to choose out of those um, four intervals. So 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 3 to 3, or 3 to 4. So this is basically 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I'm going to say f of 0. And now I just plug in my 0 to this. When I get, when I plug in 0 here, can y'all see this? Okay. When I plug in zero here, I get zero minus three plus zero. So then that gives me negative three for f of zero. For f of one, I get one minus three is negative two plus one. That gives me negative one. I multiply these together. I get three, which is not less than zero. So it's not this interval. I already have my f of one for this interval. So I'm just going to go ahead and evaluate at f of two. f of two, that gives me 16 minus three. That gives me 13. Um plus 2, that gives me 15. So f of 1, negative 1, times f of 2, 15, gives me negative 15, which is less than 0. So that tells me, which is, you can also say, look, look at it like this, um, f of a is less than 0, which is less than f of b. And because f of a is negative 1, negative 1 is less than 0, less than 15, Therefore, my interval um, where I have at least one root is 1 to 2. 
using the I, using um, the intermediate value theorem. Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so that was a good question. His question was, how would we do it if they didn't give us intervals or uh, multiple choice? In this case, they would they would have to. I'm not gonna say they would have to, but nine times, like nine point nine times out of ten, they're gonna give you an interval so you can test it um, using IVC. Yes, go ahead. That using a different theorem, if I'm not mistaken. Um, towards the end, I'm gonna have to go through the theorems and see which one it is, but I believe that's using like the mean value. But that there, one is asking, is just asking if there's a root in between that interval, and then other theorems are saying, okay, well, how many roots do I have? What are my roots? Does that make sense? Um, but we can go over that a little later as well. So good question. Any other questions? Um, real quick, everybody in here is in here for Calc 1. If you're here for Orgo, it's right across on the other room. All right, cool. So that was number six. As I said, number seven, I'm going to omit, and then um, they will be posted soon. Number eight. It says, let this function Minus 3c, what time is it? Excuse me. Plus 1. Excuse me. Describe the position of a particle for t is greater than 0. So my time is greater than 0. Find velocity and acceleration of the particle. All right, cool. At, oh, at t equals 2. Okay, so basically with this one, you're just taking the first and second derivative. Um, so they gave us the position equation. The derivative of position is velocity, and the derivative of velocity is acceleration. That's all you got to remember when it comes to this. Um, what is the derivative of what? Um, and for my engineers, um, you guys will have to like memorize that. So just always know derivative of position is velocity. Derivative of velocity is acceleration. Um, so now all I have to do is take the derivative of this. So the derivative of st or velocity gives me 2t minus 3. And now I evaluate that at t equals 2. And that gives me 2 times 2 minus 3. 4 minus 3 gives me 1. Now it's asking me for this acceleration. So the second derivative, derivative of t or a of t gives me 2. I don't have anywhere to plug in t, so I just know it's 2 off rip. Question? Nope. All right, cool. Number 9. Find the derivative of, so I'm going to say my f of x equals cosine times sine tangent x. Um, find f prime of x. So what's my rule that I'm going to be using with this? Chain rule. Awesome. Start from the outside, work your way in. As I was saying with the other one, be sure when you take the, the derivative of this, you have to keep your inside. Do not change your inside. That is one of the most common mistakes. Um, just find a way to make sure you do not change your inside. Um, so f prime of x, deriv the derivative of cosine is what? negative sign. Awesome. As I said before, keeping my inside. Now multiplying it by this inside, what's the derivative of cosine? I mean of sine. Cosine. I kind of just told y'all. My bad. Tangent x times the derivative of the inside again. What is the derivative of tangent x? Secret squared x. Awesome. And that's all there is to that. Cool. All right. Um, what did number 10 say? Okay, so number 10. I wish I had my printout. 
So number 10, if, if asked, and if you need me to repeat this, please let me know. But as I said before, if you need, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You have to do the chain rule all throughout. Um, so good question. It's asking you to find the derivative of this whole thing. So you have to work all the way until you can no longer work anymore. So you have to do the derivative of this, keep in the inside, then take the derivative of the inside, which is this, but then you have to take the d derivative of the inside of that, which is the d derivative of that, and technically, you take the derivative of the inside of tangent, but the derivative of x is one. So in the end, it's like you're multiplying this by one. Make sense? Okay. Good question. All right. I'm going on to number 10. Um, if you want to read along with me with the review, that's on the website, go ahead. I'm sorry I don't have it printed out. I left it. Um, so it says, which of the following statements is correct? If f and g are increasing on an interval i, then f of g is increasing on i. If f of c equals zero, then f of x has a local maximum or minimum at x equals c. If f has an absolute max minimum value at c, then f prime of c equals zero. If f is continuous on a, on a and b and differentiable on a and b, then there is a number c in a and b such that f of c equals, I know it's a mouthful, um, equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a, e none of the above. Anybody want to take a crack at which one it may be? Okay, I heard a, I heard c. Cool. I'm sorry? b? Okay, cool. Any other? So I'm hearing three different answers. So actually, it's B. So D, D is actually um, a theorem that you all should know. So it's the mean value theorem. Um, so please go sure whenever you're done with this. Excuse me. D is the Lagrange mean value theorem. Oh, you might be right. Let me double check. This is what I was given. Um, let's see. Oh, the, the intervals are switched. Okay, hold on. I think this was written wrong um, when given to me. So let me see. That's also going to have to be one that I double check because the intervals are switched. So I'm going to say will be posted later. Um, but yes, the intervals are switched on that one. Thank you for catching that. I'm sorry. I was, I was given D, um, but I didn't catch the intervals. Yes, go ahead. Can I explain why A is wrong? Let's see. Number 10. If F and G are increasing on an interval I, then F of G is increasing on I. If F and G are increasing on an interval I. So if these functions are increasing, I can't think of why it may be wrong. But see, if it's, oh, you mean it could be negative, so below the axis, but increasing? Oh, because when you multiply them, then it would turn around. That could be it. So here's what I'm going to do for this one. I'm going to get the reasons as to, so counterexamples to each one. Um, we'll be so close later with counterexamples. So I can make sure y'all can be clarified on that as well. Um, and I, cause I don't want to say the wrong thing and then it pops up and you guys get it wrong. Yes, go ahead. These are going to be posted right here ucfstudyunion.wordpress.com. So every final exam, so this 
review is on there, and then um, I'm uploading the solutions after this, um, along with the ones that I said I'm omitting. Yeah, go ahead. Um, number ten, basically, we were going through. I was giving the wrong. I was given the wrong um, statement, so I want to make sure that I'm clearing it up. Somebody asked, why can A be wrong? I mean, why would A be wrong? Because I was given B. Um, but the intervals are switched. It's the wrong interval. Does that make sense? So on D, it's, it's the exact re replica of the mean value theorem, but the intervals are wrong. Hmm? That, that's what I'm saying. So I'm, I think I was given the wrong thing, and I don't want to tell you wrong. Um, so I'm going to give counter, find counterexamples for all of them and then clarify, which is which. Cool. Any other questions? Sorry about the confusion on that one. It will be cleared up shortly. Um, number 11. Number 11 states, to evaluate this, pi over 2, as it approaches from the left of tangent x minus secant x. Um, oh, this is also another. All right. So when I plug in, as I, as I said before, when I plug in um, pi over 2, I'm just going to plug it in even if I know it's not going to work. Um, tangent of pi over 2 or tangent as x approaches pi over 2 it's always going to be infinity um, every time. And then as it approaches secant, secant is 1 over cosine x, and that gives me um, this minus 1 over 0. That's undefined, so now i got to see if I can work it out some other way. Um, so this is the way I end up doing it. I took it and I said, well, tangent is also equal to sine x, over cosine x, and secant is also equal to 1 over cosine x. If I evaluate that, I end up getting sine x minus 1 over cosine x. Now I can plug in, if I plug in my pi over 2, sine x pi over 2 is 1, um, according to my unit circle, so 1. And then cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So now I have 0 over 0. When I have 0 over 0, I can use L'Hopital's. Oh, sorry. So, if I go to use L'Hopital's and take it, and I take, I'm going to take it right here. So, if I take L'Hopital's of that, the derivative of sine of x gives me cosine of x. The derivative of one is zero. Is of one is zero, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine x. Now, if I plug in. Um, pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Um, cosine, I mean, sine of negative sine of pi over 2 is negative 1. That ends up giving me 0. So this one um, is very easy to want to say undefined or something, but you just really have to keep going um, until you're completely sure. But in this case, you see I had to manipulate it even more to get, um, to, to be able to use L'Hopital's. You can only use it if it's 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Yes. Um, in this case, no. But there are cases that there is. Um, usually, if, what are the cases? It's usually, I'm sorry. Oh, you're right, because it looks, the graph looks something like this. If I'm not mistaken, it looks like that. So it just keeps going and going and say this is pi over 2. So it's pi of the closest one. Really? The other way. Y'all, I am losing it this morning. I'm sorry. Or this afternoon. No, this is tangent, isn't it? Hmm. 
Ah, so this one. That one? Okay. Hmm. I don't want to tell you guys wrong on this one either. All right, cool. So we're go what I'm going to do is, this is what I ended up getting, and this is also what we got on the solutions. Um, but let me see how, what this would do to this. So I'm going to start this one as well. Cool? Sorry about that. All right, number 12. Any other questions before we move on? All right. So number 12. It says, if f of 1 equals 6, f of 1 equals 6, oh, f prime of x, greater than or equal to 2, for 3, how small can f of 3 possibly be? So this is where our mean value theorem comes in. Um, so this is where our mean value theorem comes in. Um, and you have to make sure that it is continuous um, on A and B and differentiable on A and B. Um, and in this case it is. So we can keep going and use the theorem. So the theorem states this. F of A. Cool. This is our theorem. What I'm looking for is the minimum number of F of 3, which in this case is going to be my F of B. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug in. So 3 minus f of a, which is going to be 6, over 3 minus 1. I don't like writing with pens. Over 2. So in this case, your f of x is going to be, I mean, your f prime of x is going to be kind of like your sub for f prime of c. And you, so now you say, I shouldn't have wrote therefore, but I'm going to clear that up in the solutions I post. So now I use that as my sub for here. Okay? So 2 equals f of 3, uh, I wrote that wrong. It's not an equal sign. You, ha you still have to use um, that. So 2 is less than or equal to this equation. Take that, you get 12. So the minimum value, my signs are wrong. Oh, I wrote my sign wrong here. Sorry. No, I didn't. Hmm? Something's wrong with my sign. Give me just a second. Right here? Yes. Okay, I knew I flipped it wrong somewhere. Thank you. Okay. So be careful with that. Easy mistakes, easy mistakes. Don't make those. Um, so this is going to be my minimum value of f of 3 using my mean value theorem. Yes. Um, because you, you're giving your interval. So really my interval is 1 to 3. Can you still hear me okay? 
Um, my interval is one to three, and I have to know that it is continuous on this interval. Um, let me make sure. Yes, I have to make sure that it's continuous on this interval and that it's also differentiable on this interval. In this case, it is um, given, these, given these two. Was that your question? Would you put an equal sign? Um, I just kept it because of my sign, just because of my sign. Um, but, excuse me, if you want to say, like, just to be clear, if this comes up on the final, um, you can say the smallest value of S3 is 10. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say equal to 10, but I would just say, I would just say it in a sentence if you want to just be too precise. Um, but I just kept my sign convention because that's what I got it on. No problem. All right, cool. 13. Thirteen says, find the most general antiderivatives of the function f of x equals x plus one, x minus one, and I want to find this. Um, first, I had highly suggest go ahead and um, factoring this out, not factoring, but um, foiling it out. And you end up getting x squared minus 1. And now you can go ahead and take the derivative. Antiderivative, excuse me. Um, so with this, it's completely the opposite um, of your other rule. So instead of multiplying by the exponent and then subtracting 1, you're going to add 1 and then divide by the given exponent. So add 1 to the exponent. That gives me 3. X, yeah, that gives me 3. And then I divide by 3. So that gives me x cubed over 3. If you have a constant, it's just that constant multiplied by the given variable. Um, so my variable is x. Negative 1 times x gives me negative x. Always, always plus c. And then you're done. Simple as that. Questions? Awesome. All right, 14. Find f if f prime of x equals 2x minus 3 sine x and yeah, equals 2. So with this one, we want to find our original function. Um, so, but it wants us to find our, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that as we go. So once we find our original function, um, to get back to that, we know we have to take the integral of this equation. So it looks like this. Same thing as we did before. Um, you're going to add 1 to the exponent, which gives us 2, and divide by that. So you get 2x over 2. Those cancel. And then this one, um, that constant... You keep that constant, and then you multiply it by the antiderivative of sine, which is going to be negative, I'm sorry, which is going to be cosine, mm -mm, negative cosine. So that plus just comes from me multiplying a negative by a negative. Yes? It would be x squared, thank you. Questions? Yes, plus C. Yeah, I'm getting, sorry. So yes, you're going to get, you have plus C. Now, I have my equation, but I still don't have my F of prime. I still don't have my plus C, so I don't have my entire equation. Um, so they give me this F of 0 equals 2 because they want me to find what C is. So I can have the entire equation. So now, I'm just going to flip and say 14 continues. So now I have this, and my equation is x squared plus 3 cosine x plus c. And I'm giving f of 0 equals 2. So when my x equals 0, my entire equation is equal to 2. So I'm going to plug in 0 squared plus 3 of cosine of 0 plus c equals 2. Everybody see that? So for every x, I plug in 0, and then I just set that entire equation equal to 2. And now I solve, that gives me 3 
plus C, which has cosine of zero is one, times three is three, that's two, so my C is negative one. So now, my F of X looks like this. Minus one. Questions? Okay. Number 15. Number 15 says, find the area of the region under the curve. And this is my curve above the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 4. Um, and it's saying above the x-axis axis because it's just um, accounting for your negative numbers because you can't take the radical. You can, but you don't, you're not, in this case, you're not using imaginary numbers. I'm using real numbers. So to find the area under a curve is basically you're taking the integral of that curve. So if they were to say find the area under the curve of x squared, you're just taking the integral of x squared and then plugging in from your bounds. Um, so here, we're just going to take the area. So our bounds are going to be x equals 4 and x, um, equals, x equals 0 and x, x equals 4. That's given. And this is my curve with respect to dx. So your bounds should be x equals, this should be dx, and your equation should also be um, with respect to x. Cool? All right. So I'm going to rewrite this just for ease to look like this. Same thing. Add 1, that gives you 3 over 2. And now I have 2 over 3 times x to the 3 over 2 from 0 to 4. Um, and then what you do when you plug these in, you plug in this number over 3, 4, minus um, the function with when you plug in this number. That goes to 0 because that's 0. And then this gives you, what is that, 4 cubed, 64 squared, 8, 8 times 2 is 16, 16 over 3. Cool. Number 16. This is a pretty one. Um, right, 2017. So this one is asking you to find the 217th derivative of sine of x. Um, so no, you do not have to go 217 times. Um, it's actually a method to this. Um, so for the first derivative, our, we know our first derivative of, um, of sine of x is cosine of x. We know our second derivative is negative sine of x. We know our third derivative is negative cosine of x. And we know our fourth derivative is sine of x. So then that just keeps going. So that means the fifth derivative is cosine, the sixth derivative is, sine of, is negative sine, and so on. Um, so your, what you want to do in this case is find a pattern. Um, and you know that for every fourth time or the time that is divisible by four, it's going to end up being the sine of x. So what I want to do is find the closest number closer to 2017 divisible, 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 gosh, divisible by four. Um, so that's 2016. So if I say four, Divided by 2016, that gives me 5, and that gives me 54. So for every, by the time I get through the fourth derivatives, 54 times, I'm at 2016. So that means my 2016th derivative is sine of x. So going on, my 2017th derivative should be cosine of x. Make sense? Cool. So D2017 of sine of x equals cosine of x. So it's just finding the pattern. Yes, go ahead. Um, 
um, I know a lot of these came from a previous sign-in. This is last semester? Okay. So if it's last semester. Huh? Are they rewriting it? Oh. So I'm hoping, so no, now knowing that it came from last semester's final, I'm hoping that um, the same concept, really, because I mean the same people that wrote it last semester are more than likely the same people that are going to write it this semester, and they want to know the same thing. So yes, um, easy, easier concepts, but probably because it was longer. Um, but yeah, not really sure. But hopefully it'll be quite the same. Number 17, um, if a function is, I, I don't have the paper for this, um, so this is another positive one. If a function is always positive, then what must be true about its derivative? Um, a, the derivative is increasing. B, the derivative is decreasing. C, the derivative is always positive. D, the derivative is negative. Is never negative. Or E, you can't conclude anything about the derivative. Anybody want to take a shot at that one? Nobody? Okay. So this one, um, it's going to be you can't conclude anything because your derivative tells you about the function, um, not the other way around. See? So you can't determine, from your function, you can't determine anything about derivative. The derivative, but from your derivative, you can determine certain things about your function. Cool. Number 18. Find the absolute maximum value of the function f of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared minus 1 in the closed interval 1 to 3. Um, what's the theorem? I can't think of the name. Oh, it, it's, it's not a theorem. It's just like you're finding your critical points and then plugging those in. Um, so I'll go to show you guys what I'm talking about. So here I'm, I need to take the derivative to find my critical points and then from my critical points and also my points on my interval, I can tell what my maximum, absolute max and what my absolute min on that interval is gonna be. Understand? All right, so three x squared minus six x and then I set that equal to zero to find my critical points. That gives me x times 3x minus 6 equals 0. So my critical points are 0 and 2. Now, I can't use x equals 0 to find my absolute max and min. Why? I'm sorry? Awesome. So it's not in that interval. So if you get a critical point that isn't in that interval, you can't use it because that's not what it's asking you. Cool? So my points that I'm going to use are f of 1, f of 2 and f of 3. 1 and 3 from my endpoints, and then 2 from my critical points. Okay. So f of 1 is going to be 1 minus 3, which is negative 2 minus 1, that gives me negative 3. f of 2, that gives me 8 minus 12, negative 4 minus 1, that gives me negative 5. 3, that gives me 27 minus 27. Minus one, so that gives me negative one. So my absolute, what is it, absolute max? That is f of three. Questions? Okay. Yes. Um, you, that's usually when you're like looking for if it's increasing or decreasing on like certain things. So you would take your critical points. I know what you're talking about. So you have your number line and you take your critical points and then take values on either side of those critical points. And so if it's positive or negative, that tells you whether it's increasing or decreasing. And we'll kind of touch on that in one of these problems later. Um, but that is a good question. So you just have to do this. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's F of three. Because that's where you have your highest value. Okay. 
It's negative, I'm sorry. It says find the absolute maximum value. So you have an absolute maximum value at f of 3, which is going to be negative 1. Sorry, I wrote it wrong. Cool. Yes. You sure? Uh -huh. Any other questions? All right. So number 19. For the following two pro oh, it gives, it gives us a graph. Um, for the following two problems, let f be a function and f prime be its derivative. The graph of f prime is given below. All right, so I'm just going to draw like a rough sketch because we're going to need it. So here's my sketch of this. So this is what it looks like. This is touching that, sorry. And this is our graph of f prime. So for number 19, it says, on what intervals are, is f decreasing? So remember earlier we were saying your derivative can tell you about your original function. Um, so it's asking us on what intervals is f decreasing. Can anybody kind of point out just from the graph alone? Can y'all see the graph well? Can anybody point out from um, where it's increasing? I mean, I'm sorry, decreasing? Okay. So somebody said where it's below the x-axis. Okay. So it's below from here. So negative infinity to negative 2, right? And then from 0 to 2. I'm sorry, 0 to 4. And that's about it. This? Yeah. Yes. So it's asking us, I'm sorry, it's asking us about our ori original function. So this is the graph of our derivative, and it's saying where is our original function decreasing. So your derivative, whenever your derivative is negative, that tells you, okay, that's where my function is decreasing. Yes. Hmm? I, I can't hear your question. At x equals 2, it's still decreasing. Mm -hmm. It's so uh, it doesn't cross it if that makes sense. So it, it, it just hits it and it goes right back down. I'm not sure of the exact I'm not sure of an exact terminology of how to like completely explain it. Um, but just know because it's not actually crossing that x axis, it's gonna be still decreasing. Exactly. So that's a great question. If they said, okay, so where is x increasing, or where is my original function increasing based off of, um, based off of f of prime, it would be from negative 2 to 0, from 4 to infinity. So great question. Any others? All right, cool. Yes. No, it's not included. Oh, you mean right here. I thought you were talking about right here. I'm sorry. Um, so I guess in this case it is included. Is it? Okay, so on the graph, it looks like it's hitting zero, but it could be right under. Okay. Yeah, it is the, so our answer choices, 
are what we have here. Negative one to one union, two to three. What's negative one to one? We know that's not it because it's crossing. So that's off the list. Our other one is negative one to one and the other is none of the above. Um, so this is the one that makes sense. Now what exactly, what is, is the exact reasoning for this? I can't say for sure. So I'm gonna see about that too. Oh my God, I wish I. So I'm gonna see for sure about this as well. Okay. So thank you, that's a good question. I'll make sure to get that for you all. Um, I'm gonna keep repeating this, but check, keep checking the UCF Study Union website. As I said, either tomorrow or Tuesday, everything will be up, everything. Um, so you can study with your friends as well. Um, for which of the following values of X does F have a local maximum? Can anybody tell me where it may have a local maximum? Zero, why? Awesome. So it's going from positive to negative. So you remember you were kind of asking about like critical point. So at this, in this case, our zero would be a, ne a critical point, but it's positive over here and negative over here. So it's going to look like this. When it looks kind of like a mountain, we know it's a maximum. Here, it's a minimum because it's going from negative to positive. So it looks like that. Same thing with this negative to positive, it's gonna look like this. So that, those are minimums. This is our maximum because it's going from positive to negative. Clear? Okay. All right, so now we're down to our numerical. So I'm just gonna label them as 21. Um, I'm not gonna do the actual Roman numerals. So it says, using the, de the definition, let's go to the next page, that's gonna be long. Using the definition of a derivative, use the de definition of a derivative to find f prime of x for f of x equals x squared minus two x plus five. So, my definition of a derivative looks something like this. Think it as h approaches zero of x, f of x plus h minus f of h over h. Are they giving y'all a formula sheet? Do y'all know? They're not? Okay, so this is something you have to memorize, to memorize. So this is always the definition of a derivative. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, thank you. So minus f of x. Then you just go in and plug in and evaluate. So limit plus h. Oh, this is x plus h squared minus 2 of x plus h plus five minus x squared plus two x. So I'm just going I'm just going to go ahead and distribute that negative to this equation. So minus x squared plus two x minus five. And then I'll foil that and you should end up getting mm, squared plus two x h plus h squared minus 2x minus 3h plus 5 minus x squared plus 2x minus 5. So you should see that a lot of things, oh, let me put that over h. A lot of these things cross out, okay? Your x squared crosses out. Now you're left with this. Plus 2x h minus 2h, you take an h out, you end up getting plus 2x minus 2, limit as h approaches 0, you get 2x plus 2. 
So you can always double check yourself after you've done this long thing. It is easy to make mistakes, but now you already know the rules of how to um, derive a function. So 2x minus 2. Oh, sorry. That's a minus. 2x minus 2. Easy way to double check yourself. Yes. Yes. So that's what I did right here. So um, I distributed this negative here. So negative x squared plus 2x minus 5. So yes, good question. Any others? Yes. Um, so what I did here, um, I should have took the extra step and distributed it. So I just took out and divided everything by h. So once I divided h squared by h, I ended up getting h. Once I divided 2x h by h, I ended up getting 2x minus 2. And then I divided 2h divided by h and it ended up getting 2. Right here? I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. You plugged in 0 for h. No problem. Sorry I didn't clarify that. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Hmm. So the next one I'm going to label 22. It says, use a squeeze theorem to evaluate the limit of x goes to zero of x squared cosine 2017 divided by x squared. Um, so it specifically says use squeeze theorem. All right. So with this one, um, you're basically taking your bounded function and setting it in those bounds and then adding on as you go. Um, so because your inside of cosine looks a little funky, it, it kind of looks hard to approach, but it's not, it's going to be the same situation no matter what is on the inside of cosine, whether it be x or it be x to the 52nd, it always has to be in between what two bounds? Negative one and one. So same case with this, um, whatever your x is going to be, it has to be in between negative one and one, even though I know it, as it approaches zero, that doesn't exist, but you're still going to know that it's in between negative 1 and 1. Um, now, I now, now add on. So whatever I do to the middle, I have to do to the outside. If I'm multiplying the inside by x squared, I also have to do the same to the outside. So negative 1 times x squared is negative x squared. You add, your, I mean, you multiply your x squared into the inside, and then 1 times x squared is x squared. Now you take the limit as x approaches 0, and if you get the same thing on both sides, then that means that's what your um, limit is going to. And that happens. It goes from 0 to 0. Questions? This? Yes, so you basically your goal is to set whatever your bounded function is equal to, I mean, set it as if it's bounded, and then you're just adding, adding into whatever you do. So for example, or not for example, but because I want this to end up looking like this, I have to do whatever to the inside, whatever I do to the inside to the outside. So because the inside is multiplied by x squared, and I'll have to multiply by x squared for it to look like that, I multiply the outsides by x squared as well. Yes, go ahead. I can't hear you. Yes, yes. So um, because it is a trigonom trigonometric um, whatever, you know what I'm saying, it's going to be bounded. Yeah. So if it was sine, it would still be negative 1 and 1. Go ahead. She had a question, sorry. You mean like where do you even start? You're always going to start with your trig function. 
So you, every time you start with what's bounded, which is going to be your trig function. Negative one and one. So um, I actually have a question. So if it were cosine squared, so say they gave us this, um, and they gave us cosine, this may not work, but it's okay. If they gave us cosine of x, I would start it with cosine. So don't start it with, you can start it with cosine squared, but if you do, you have to set up your bounds different, and I'm about to show you that. So say they gave you this, and they said find the limit as x approaches zero. You know it doesn't, as x approaches zero, you know it, it's basically impossible. So what you have to do, or I'm sorry, let's say as x approaches infinity, um, you end up getting infinity over infinity. And, and you could use L'Hopital's, but say they said u squeeze theorem. If they actually do u squeeze theorem, you start off again with your cosine. My cosine x is bounded in between negative one and one. Now if I were to square the inside, because I have to make it look like this, so I have to square it, my bounds would not be negative one squared and one squared. It'd be zero to one. It'd be zero because my only numbers of cosine squared isn't just one and one. So I could have cosine of pi over four. Th that gives me a decimal. But it's greater than zero, but still, le still less than one. Does that make sense? So the only reason it can't be one to one is because that's not the only value that cosine squared is going to give you. Yes, go ahead. And that, yeah, that, so yes, theoretically, it, negative one squared is one, but because you can have a value inside of this that gives you like a decimal, it can't be, it's, it's not just one. So if I said, this is one, I'm saying the only value I can get for no, no matter what x I put in is going to be one, but that's not the case. The case is no matter what value I'm going to put in, it can't be negative because it's squared. So this is that exception that I wanted to make sure to show you guys just in case it comes up. So please remember that. It's not going to be one to one. It's going to be zero to one. Go ahead. No, you are. That's your, that's your answer, zero. That's what your squeeze theorem states. Um, the, this right here, because when I took the limit as x approaches zero, I got zero and zero. So if this function is in between zero and zero, then my, it has to converge to zero. Mm -hmm. So once you get to, once it looks exactly how it looks here, that's when you go, with, go ahead and plug in. So, so using this one as my example, I have cosine, so cosine squared, right? Now, I can, if I divide both sides by x, that's all I have. So it looks exactly like that. I plug in my x as it approaches infinity. As 1 over infinity goes to 0, 1 over infinity goes to 0. Therefore, the limit of this function goes to 0. Cool? So squeeze theorem, just set your bounds and do, which, do whatever function you need to do so it can be um, equal. But this isn't the, this isn't the solution I'm going to post. I'm going to post a clearer one um, with everything that we went over today, today that I said I was going to post for you guys. So it'll be a lot more um, in-depth and not as squiggly and scraggly as this. Okay. Oh, excuse me. 22. Or 23, sorry. Um, before we keep going, because we have about 45 minutes, I'm going to pass out or just give you guys oops, this eval. And please be sure to fill this out and then give it to me right before you leave. Um, so if you have time, please fill this out. Did the screen go off? I think my screen went off. Mm -hmm. Did I just pop up? Oh, thank you. Some don't need this many, but pass these around for me. Thank you. Ah, that's okay. 
Thank you. All right, so continuing on, please make sure everybody gets one of those. Um, but continuing on, it says, use implicit differentiation to find y prime if e to the y of cosine x equals e squared plus sine of xy. So we have to use implicit differentiation because I have Oh, I see, I see. Zoom out or zoom in. There we go. Oh, I see. Dead bandage, huh? Thank you. Cool. Um, so, I have this. But because I have my, my equation ha is of two different functions, um, I use what they told me to use, implicit differentiation. So here, I'm going to use... Um, left times the derivative of the right, so or my first times the derivative of the second. So e to the y times the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. That looks like a minus. You know what? That's a big multiplier in the negative. Plus the derivative of my first, so it's going to be e to the y times the derivative of my exponent, which in this case is going to be y prime because it's implicit times cosine x. Question? Nope. All right, so this is a constant, so the derivative of that is zero, plus the derivative of this, which is cosine, times the inside. Oh, that's going to be wrong. So times first, so xy prime, plus First under the second. I'm sorry, plus y. So just to so it'll look a little bit better, I'm going to rewrite this equation. Y prime ey of cosine x minus ey sine x equals minus xy prime plus y. Question. Okay. Right, cool. Let me double check myself. All right, so now what I'm looking to do, because because I want to find y prime, I need to get my y primes alone and solve for that. Um, but the only way to do that is to multiply this side out. So it now looks like this. So now what I'm going to do is put both of my terms with y prime on the same side and all of my terms without y prime on the same side. Distribute my y prime. And then divide both sides by this term. The rest is just your basic algebra, but your your main thing is being able to get your y primes out of the original function. Questions? No questions. Okay. So go on to twenty four. So evaluate the limit as x approaches 0 of this. So this is a funny one. Um, 
This one you have to manipulate in a different way, and I'm going to show you guys that. Um, but as I said, always plug in your zero first. I know you, you more than likely it's not going to work, but just to kind of see what you're working with, you end up getting 1 to the 1 over 0. Um, so your exponent is your biggest problem in this case. Um, so now you know you have to manipulate your exponent. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you guys this. So I'm going to take my e to the ln. So anytime I have e to the ln, I know that goes to 1. Um, so you can put that in there, but keep in mind, you usually can't just add anything that you want. The only reason this is valid, in a sense, is because that gives you still 1 times this equation. Um, you can't just add in a 3 to a limit problem if it makes it easier, but because you're adding a whole different constant. But in this case, you can add this because, as I said before, it gives you 1. So I take e to the ln of this function. Same thing as this, it just looks a little bit different, but it does allow me to manipulate it. <coughs> Sorry. Um, it does allow me to manipulate it. Using my rules of logarithms, I know that I can pull out, pull this exponent to the front. Um, so then this gives me e to the 1x ln of 1 minus 3x. So then this looks like this. Minus 3x to the x. So now, what I'm going to do is take my limit as x approaches 0 of this function up here, because it's the same as taking my limit as e to this, but my e, in this case, is like my constant. So limit x approaches 0 of ln of 1 minus 3x over x. I plug in 0, and I'm getting ln of 1 over 0. ln of 1 is 0 over 0. 0 over 0. So when I, I know when I get 0 over 0, or infinity over, in, over infinity, I can use L'Hopital's and taking the derivative of that using L'Hopital's. The derivative of, derivative of the top, excuse me, is 1 over 3x multiplied by the inside, so negative 3 over 1. That, end up give, that ends up giving me negative 3 over 1 minus 3x. If I plug in 0, I end up getting negative 3 over 1. So the limit as x approaches 0 of this function is negative 3. Then I just go back in, plug in my negative 3 to that, and I end up getting e to the negative 3 or e 1 over e to the third. Clear? Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x multiplied by the derivative of the inside. It just so happens that the derivative of the inside of ln of x is 1. So that is actually a very good question. Please don't forget that. So if you had ln of x squared and they wanted you to find the derivative, yes, it would be 1 over x squared, but multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which would be 2x. So in, a, in the end, you end up getting 2x over x squared. Questions? That was a very good question. All right. All right, so number 25 says, find an equation I'm writing this out. Find an equation of the tangent line to the curve. So this is my tangent line. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is my curve. 3x sine of x at the point when x equals pi over 2. So basically, when it asks me to find my tangent line, um, I have to know what my tangent line equation looks like. And it looks like this. y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. Forever and always. Um, so, my unknowns in this case is this, this, and this. Oh, I'm sorry, I know my x naught, and that's this. Now, to find my y naught, I can just plug in my pi over 2 here. So, when x equals pi over 2, I need to know what my y equals. So, 3 times pi over 2 
times sine of pi over 2. I know my sine of pi over 2 is 1, so that gives me 3 pi over 2 times 1, which gives me 3 pi over 2. So that's my y. Now I have this. Now all I'm stuck looking for is my slope. Now, we know that the slope of a curve is the derivative of the function. So my y prime is equal to my slope. So now I just have to find my y prime. And that's going to give me 3x times cosine of x plus 3 times sine of x. Clear. Any questions? Okay. Make sure. And now I just go ahead and plug in my given x. So 3 pi over 2 times cosine of pi over 2, that's going to give me 0. So that's, here I'll write that later. Pi over 2. This is going to give me 0 plus 3. So that gives me 3. Okay. Now I have everything I needed. Um, I have my m because my y prime is, gives me m. I have my y naught and my x naught, and I just go in and plug in. Oh, I'm sorry. My y naught is 3. Pi over 2. Question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So from my original equation, I want to know what my y is when my x equals pi over 2. Yes. Um, you should be able to leave it in this form. This is fine. Because in, in a sense, it's the same thing. Um, so just to save you less work, leave it in this form is okay. Questions? Great questions, by the way. So thank you. All right, cool. Number 26. This one is asking us to evaluate the integral using the definition of the definite integral. Um, so let me, let me write this out and then I'll go on. So x cubed minus 4x dx. Now they're giving us hints of what my i is. So this is all given what I'm about to write. No, sorry, that's one. And my third one. So these are given, and my definition of a definite integral looks something like, let me see if I can find it. Where did I put it? Oh. So this is what I have to read. As n approaches infinity of the f of dx. Okay, so this is what I have to use. Remember that. Now my ci is going to be going to be given by um, my bounds. So a plus b minus a over n i. Your a and b. This is a. This is b. Just the values of your bounds. So my a is 0 plus 2 minus 0 over n to the i. So that gives me 2i over n. My 
X or my delta X I is going to be B minus A over N. So that gives me 2 minus 0 over N, which gives me 2 over N. Question. So these are my equations for that. These all tie in together. So now, in my equation, everywhere my C of I is, which I know my C of I is 2I N, I can plug it in everywhere there's an X multiplied by my delta XI, which is going to be 2N. That now looks like this. Yes, sorry. We good? We still waiting? Okay. I good to turn? Yep, okay. So, limit as n approaches infinity of, ooh, make sure I'm not mixed up. Did I write it wrong? Real quick, I made a mistake and I didn't include this. So make sure to include that summation in there. But I'm going to write it here. So my f of c for just plugging in 2, two i of n everywhere my x is, b minus 4, 2i of n multiplied my, by my delta xi, which is going to be 2n. So now I need to um, solve for that and factor and all that great stuff. And I have 2 cubed is 8i times 2 is 16 over n cubed minus 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 over, oh I'm sorry, this is n to the fourth. So what, basically what I'm doing is I'm bringing, multiplying this out and then bringing this in as well. Um, so that gives me n squared. So this is all of this multiplied together. Cool? All right. So what I'm going to do next is apply the summation to my i's um, to look like this. Oh, I'm so I multiplied this out to these as well. As well. So, two, 2 cubed, I got 8 i cubed, n cubed, but then I also multiplied by this 2, 2 over n. So, I'll write that out. And then doing that, when I multiply those out, I got there. Okay. So now I'm just distributing the summation to my i's. i cubed. And I'm taking these um, functions out. of i. So if you remember, given in the problem, they already told us what these were in terms of n. And they told us that they 
it comes at the summation of i cubed was n squared, you can see it, n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. So I'm going to plug that in for summation i cubed squared times n plus 1 over 4 minus 16 n squared. And our summation for i is n times n plus 1 over 2. So I'm going to plug that in here. Everybody clear? Clear why I got those from? Those were given in the equation. Yes, ma'am. What did I get first? The first what? Oh, the first 16? Whoop. Um, I got the first 16 from this. So 2 cubed is 8 multiplied by this 2 because I had to distribute this 2 here and to here. So 8 times 2 get, gave me my 16. Make sense? Okay. All right. So I have my summations, and I'm just going to go ahead and factor those, or I'm not going to completely factor this because it would make it a little bit harder, but I'm going to put everything together. So 16 n squared n plus 1 squared over n to the fourth times 4 minus 16 times n, n plus 1 over n squared times 2. So I can cancel some things out. I can take out this 4, and if I divide it by, by 4 on the top, I get 4. Um, I can divide by this n squared. That goes away, and this exponent goes to 2. Clear? Makes sense so far. All right. So then I can do the same over here. I can take that out. This gives me 8. Then I can take this out. And that n cancels out on the top. And my exponent cancels, cancels out on the bottom. So now I end up getting this. n plus 1 squared over n squared minus 8 times n plus 1 over n. Uh -uh, what did I do wrong? So, so I can combine these. I'm going to go ahead and multiply this side by n and n because that gives me n squared. That makes sense? So n over, I'm going to multiply by n over n just so I can combine these. And I'll end up getting 1 squared over n squared minus 8 times n plus 1 times n over n squared. And then that gives me over n squared. So that makes it a little bit easier. Now I have to... Um, simplify the top. And that's going to give me 4n squared plus 8n plus 4. So that's just me simplifying that. Minus, that gives me n squared plus n. 8n squared plus Eight n. I'm sorry, minus eight n, because you have to remember to distribute that negative, as I almost did not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at this point, because everything is in terms of n, you're just simplifying, simplifying, and simplifying. But make sure to catch little mistakes. Um, that's going to give me. So these 8n's cancel. This gives me negative 4n squared plus 4 over n squared. And I'm going to flip to the next page. Am I okay to flip to the next page so y'all can write in?
I'm going to flip. And approaches infinity of negative 4 n squared plus 4 over n squared. So I'm going to divide everything by my highest exponent, which is n squared. Gives me negative 4 plus 4 over n squared over 1. If I plug in infinity, that goes to 0, so I end up getting negative 4. Questions? Um, so to get, because if I plug in infinity here, I end up getting infinity plus 4 over infinity, and I can't stick with that, so I divided everything by my highest exponent. So I divided this by n squared, so I got negative 4. I divided by, this by n squared, so I got 4 over n squared, and I divided this by n squared, so I got 1. So now when I plug in infinity, I get negative 4. A constant over infinity goes to 0, so negative 4 plus 0 over 1 gives me negative 4. Has everybody gotten an evaluation sheet? No? If whoever has the evaluation sheets, can you make sure, can you hold them up if you have them? It was a big stack of evaluation sheets. Who didn't have them, can you raise your hand? Oh, yeah, can we get those around, please? We have about 20 minutes. So I'm going to ask again in about 10 minutes and make, it, make sure it gets around. Um, so number 27. Twenty-seven part A. It's asking me to find the derivative of this. Um, this one, you have to use something called u sub um, because there is no like certain rule um, for this. So you're basically, you basically want to identify a function in here and whenever you take that derivative, whenever you take the derivative of that function, it's also present within this integral. So to put um, words into writing, I'm going to set my u equals to ln of x and I'll show you why in a minute. So when I take the derivative of my u, it's going to be du times the derivative of ln of x. We already established that the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x, but whenever I take the derivative, I always have to add in my dx. So as I was saying, you want to find a function in the integral that way when you have the function and also you take the derivative of that function, that derivative is also present. So this also looks like this. Cosine of ln of x times 1 over x dx. So we can see this is also this. That makes sense? So now I'm just going to sub everything. So cosine of u, because I established my u to be ln of x, and times du. So my du is 1 over x dx. Questions? That clear? So now I just go ahead and evaluate it as a regular integral. The derivative of cosine, uh, the antiderivative of cosine, excuse me, is negative sine. So negative sine u, now whatever my u is, I, I want to go ahead and plug um, my original function back in. Am I, huh? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you. It is sine, not negative sine. Um, so yes, thank you for that. So it is sine. So whatever I have my u for, I want to go ahead and plug that back in. So now it's sine of ln of x plus c. Don't forget that plus c. And if you want to double check yourself, just take the derivative. Um, we're gonna, we would do that using chain rule. So it would be cosine of ln of x times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. And that gives me the exact same thing that I had before. Questions? Okay. Um, so I'm going to omit part B because I don't have um, it written out right. 
Um, so that's going to be the one of the ones I upload for you guys um, either tomorrow or Tuesday. So again, be sure to check the website. Um, so this one's kind of a long one, but that's okay. This is our last one. And we have about 15 minutes. So I'm going to finish this one, and I'm going to leave the last five minutes for, like, any questions that I may be able to answer. Um, did I say it was 29? I'm sorry, it's 28. I'm omitting 29, too, so. So 28. says, use the guidelines below to sketch the curve. Y equals... By f of x equals 2x squared over x squared minus 1. Um, part A says find the domain of x, f of x. What is my domain? Awesome. So basically anywhere it's undefined and x in this case cannot be negative 1 or positive 1. Just for, um, for my, I guess, for just working it out, um, you would set the bottom equal to zero because you know that the bottom cannot be equal to zero. So no matter what that function was, wherever the bottom is undefined, um, that's where how you define your domain. So I'm going to set x squared minus 1 equal to zero. I get x squared equals 1. I get x equals plus or minus 1. So... I need to write that as this, negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to 1, yes, negative 1 to 1, union 1 to infinity. So the only places it's undefined or it can't be defined is negative 1 and 1. All right. So for B. Find the x and y intercepts of f of x. Um, basically, your x intercept is where your y is equal to zero, and your y intercept is where your x is equal to zero. So you just plug in. So if this is my equation, wherever my x is equal to zero, that's where my y is zero. Or that's where my y intercept is. So y is going to give me zero over negative one, which gives me zero. So this is my y intercept. Um, because of zero, zero and zero, it's, you're going to know that my x-intercept is also going to be zero. Um, but say you don't catch that on the first try, you just sub zero for y to find your x-intercept. Um, so 2x squared over x squared minus 1. You multiply by both sides. You get 2x squared equals zero. You get x equals zero. So this is your x-intercept. Easy enough? Cool. Um, well, in this case, my y-intercept is 0 and 0. So you know that's also going to be your x-intercept as well because your x-intercept is wherever y is equal to 0 and your y-intercept is wherever x is equal to 0. Cool. So C. Verify. Verify that your, my function is even. So when my function is even, basically, this is what it needs to look like. My f of negative x needs to equal my f of positive x. So I just go in and plug that in. So 2 of negative x squared over negative x squared minus 1. Did I write that right? Yep. Equals 2 of x squared over x squared minus 1. So if those don't equal each other, then it's odd. But let's go ahead and work it out. Negative x squared is going to give me a positive. Negative x right here is going to give me a positive as well. So because my f of negative x is equal to my f of positive x, it is even. Questions? Cool. Oh, oh that's me. All right, so verify that f of x has two vertical asymptotes 
x equals 1 and x equals negative 1, and one horizontal asymptote, y equals 2. Um, so the way you find your vertical asymptotes, same thing, um, wherever your bottom, whatever your, um, not, your function is undefined, um, and where it's undefined here, I'll just rewrite it. We know it's undefined, and this is for vertical asymptotes, excuse me. So you know it's undefined wherever the bottom equals zero. So again, we set this equal to zero. I get x squared equals one. I get x equals plus or minus one. Um, and that's what the problem says. It says verify that my vertical asymptotes are one and negative one, and I just did that because I got one and negative one. Now, I need to know if it has at least one horizontal asymptote. So what you do in this case to find the horizontal asymptotes, you take the, um, the constants of the highest powers and you put and you divide them. Or if in this case, it has the same power. So it's going to be 2 over 1. of x squared over x squared, 2 over 1, because they have the same power. Yes? You have to prove it by... you would get it wrong. So they want you to say it as x approaches, which constant? I'm assuming. So they, they just want y'all to do it by limits, right? Okay. So here's what I'm going to do because we have like eight minutes and I won't have time to go through all of that because I do want to see. I do have to collect those, take a head count, um, and all that great stuff. And we still have a few more of this problem to go to. What I'm going to do is, as I said before, so I'm going to write myself a personal note. And I'm going to upload that. Sound fair? I'll try to do that for you guys. You taking limits. So never mind on the, on the easy way out, because um, I don't want you guys to lose points on that. Um, all right, cool. So for E, it says, given, so it, go, it, went, it went ahead and gave me um, my derivative, so you don't have to do it on your own. Given this, find intervals of increase, decrease, critical points, if any. Um, and you also have to double check. It's saying double check the sign of f of prime and the domain of f before writing your answer. So remember earlier, I was saying your critical points is also where, not only where your derivative is equal to zero, but also where it's undefined. Here, when I set my derivative equal to zero, I get x equals, so if I set it equal to zero, I get x equals zero, but it's also undefined at also undefined at negative 1 and 1, okay? So now, I put those on my number line. Um, I put those, I want my line to look like this. And 1. So if I'm testing out, I'm just going to test out 2 over here. Um, it's going to give me positive on the bottom, negative on the top. Oh, I'm sorry, negative 2. It's going to give me a positive on, the, positive on the top. It's always going to be positive on the bottom. So that's positive. Anything, I'm going to say negative 1 half, it's going to give me a positive on the top. It's always going to be positive on the bottom. I'm going to say 1 half, it's going to give me a negative on the top. Always going to be positive on the bottom, so it's going to be negative. And I'm going to say negative 2. It's always going to, I'm sorry, 2 it's always going to give me a negative on the top and a positive on the bottom, so it's this. So, increasing here, increasing here, decreasing here, decreasing here. See that? All right. 
So my intervals of increase negative infinity to negative one union because I can't include my negative one, negative one to zero. Um, decrease is going to be zero for one union, one to infinity. Clear? All right. So, F says, find all local minimum and maximum of values, if any, of F of X. All right. So, to find my local min and max, I take my critical point and I plug it back into my original function. So, my original function is this. I know my critical point is x equals 0 for my previous problem. If I plug that in, f of 0 gives me 2 times 0 over 0 minus 1. That gives me negative, oh, I'm sorry, definitely gives me 0. So local max, when my x is 0, my y is 0. At 0, 0. And I know it's a maximum because previously, I've seen here that it increases right here, decreases right here, so I have a maximum. Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, it wouldn't be included because it is a local max. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Well, in this, in this case, um, so no, it would not be because it's undefined. Um, so the only reason, we only tested at zero because that's the only critical point. So yes, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't be at negative one or one, even if it was an increase or a decrease. Excuse me. Okay. So almost done, almost done. Um, G. Given, okay, before I keep going, does, did everybody get an evaluation? Is there, you still have it? Who has them? Who has the packet? There should be a stack, okay. Please make sure that the ones who haven't got, gotten it get it. So last one that we'll be doing in this um, one and the last one will be put up online. Um, we're given the second derivative to be this. Find intervals of concave up con um, and down and inflection points, if any. Um, so, in this case, same thing. The way you find your inflection points is wherever it equals to zero. Um, your denominator, in this case, equals to zero. Um, oh, no, your function is set equal to zero. Excuse me. So, for... plus one. So if I set this equal to zero, I multiply both sides by this. That gives me four times three x squared plus one. I divide by four and I end up getting three x squared plus one equals zero. Solving for x, I get this. Negative one over three. But, and I end up getting this. But I can't have a negative inside my radical, so there are no inflection points. Um, but I can test um, for concave up, concave down based on where my second derivative is undefined. And I know it's undefined at negative one and one. So I'm going to test a uh, negative over here, negative two. That gives me positive, negative two. That gives me positive, so that's positive. If I put a zero in here, I end up getting a negative on the bottom. So that's negative. Um, if I plug in two, I end up getting positive. So it looks like this. Concave up is 
negative infinity to negative one, sorry, union. Let me make sure I'm not sure. Hmm? Not necessarily because the graph. Let me not tell you wrong. The graph looks like this, I believe, like somewhere or something like that. But your what tells you con your concave up, concave down is this number line right here. Negative infinity, negative one. Oh, I'm sorry. It's where it's positive, and your concave up tells you where it is where it's positive. And your concave down is where it's negative. Um, so concave up is negative infinity to negative 1. And 1 to infinity. Concave down is going to be negative 1 to 1. Okay. All right. So that wraps it up. I, don't ha I thought I was going to have time for questions. But as I said before, I'm going to post all the solutions all in detail. Um, if you have not filled out your evaluation, please do so now. Um, and if you can't, I'll be at the front and you can just pass it to me on your way out, please. 